training uh, facility at Christchurch Airport was enlarged and upgraded and named the Leonard Isaac Aviation Training Centre. The very successful uh, new Wings of the Nation NAC branding was introduced at this time when the Boeing 737ZK NAC became the first aircraft of the fleet to be rolled out in the new livery. And we come to the last era, 1975-1978. The late 1970s continued as a time of development and change. The National Party, some of us will all remember, gained power in 1975. Remember it was a landslide in 75, a landslide to later in 72. Led this time by Prime Minister uh, Robert Muldoon, a political development that was going to lead to profound repercussions for the future of NAC. Passenger growth for the year to March 1975 meant that uh, NAC carried for the first time more than 2 million passengers in one calendar year. 737 services were inaugurated in Vicargill, and in the same month, uh, Friendship 500 series services under chartered Air New Zealand commenced between Auckland and Norfolk Island. This was reminiscent of NAC South Pacific service 20 years before. In September 1975, the last Viscount was retired from NAC service after a, uh, uh, an amazing record, really. And with the retirement of both the DC-3 and the Viscount types, uh, NAC finally realised its long-term plan to operate only two aircraft types. Good idea. During 1976, a review was undertaken of passenger transport between city town centres and airports in both provincial towns and cities. A nominal charge had been introduced in 1971, but with uh, escalating costs and in the interest of the majority of passengers paying for a service they did not require, services were stopped. You might forget that. A lot of people came out to the airport in the airport bus, not by private car. NAC uh, hostesses, what you, what you see there, were given a new red, white and blue houndstooth uniform in June 1976, which was more refined and elegant than the previous uniform, it's an opinion I guess. By the mid-1970s, public opinion was slowly turning against smoking, especially in confined spaces. Consequently, NAC introduced a partial non-smoking policy on its aircraft with 30% of the seating capacity being allocated for smokers and 70% for non-smokers. And you remember the cabin was completely open, it makes sense, doesn't it? And in March 1977, NAC introduced its new Carina uh, booking and ticketing system, which had been developed over the previous two years. This replaced the DORAC reservation system the following month. At this time, 93% of reservation transactions through the country, this is 1977, were made through visual display units directly connected to central computers at the Wellington headquarters by a sophisticated medium speed communications network, cutting edge technology. It was reported in December 1977 that NAC were their 13 Fokker friendships, uh, that's the 100 series and the 500 series, was the largest operator of friendship aircraft in the world. On 16th of December of that year, NAC Friendship NFC, leaving on a charter flight to Norfolk Island, was the first aircraft to depart from the new Auckland International Airport Terminal. In September 1977, the Minister of Civil Aviation, Honourable Colin McLaughlin, unexpectedly announced that a study would be undertaken regarding a possible amalgamation of NAC and Air New Zealand. And with the changed political landscape, the process did not take long, and despite extensive reports and many objections from NAC, it was announced on the 19th of December 1977 that NAC and Air New Zealand would merge from the 1st of April the following year. The new airline would be named New Zealand Airlines Limited. Although well prior to the merger, a decision was made to retain the Air New Zealand name. Now, the decision was an abrupt and politically imposed end to New Zealand's two airline policy and came as a shock to most of the NAC staff. It was a difficult and uh, undeserved end to NAC. Even Sir, Jeff Sir Geoffrey Roberts of Air New Zealand later reflected that the merger was, quote, the right thing done at the wrong time in the wrong way, unquote. In the last couple of months of NAC operation, the corporation continued much as usual. A significant milestone was reported in March 1978 when the 30th millionth NAC passenger was carried. NAC had its last day on the 31st of March 1978 and it was a sobering time for the 3,523 staff. 
that evening flight 434, it was Captain Kirk, wasn't it? From Wellington to Auckland, operated by Boeing 737 ZKNAP through the final NAC service. Just a few brief reflections in terms of my conclusion. The 1978 merger brought to an end a distinguished and you could say unique era of New Zealand aviation history. Uh, New Zealand National Airways Corporation was iconic for, uh, for Kiwis and its demise was lamented by many. However, the mixture of political, social and commercial objectives from the 1945 NAC Act had been honourably fulfilled throughout the years. And certainly the level of uh, the volume of traffic and frequency of services had made NAC an indispensable part of the New Zealand transport system, always valued by businessmen, tourists and private travellers alike. So today, Air New Zealand can claim a, a significant part of its legacy and it needs to be constantly reminded of it. A significant part of its legacy from the remarkable era of the New Zealand Airways Corporation, 1947 to 1978. Just a couple more slides, I think you might have there, Des. What have we got? I, I didn't want to miss the opportunity of just talking about Erebus, which of course happened post-NAC. Um, but um, with my chaplaincy work in the aviation industry and my work on the Kaimai Crash Memorial, it seemed to me uh, there's a real omission here that this terrible accident, 257 people, 40th anniversary coming up uh, November next year, there's no memorial in New Zealand. There's nowhere where the 257 names can be suitably uh, displayed and I'm honoured. So in 2016, myself and a few other historians joined me we started to advocate to government that there should be a memorial for New Zealand's worst civil disaster. And when you think about the money and the attention to Pike River, with 29 victims and uh, the Canterbury Youth Coat Memorial with 185, uh, here's Erebus with 257, that's nothing to be done. Appalling. Appalling pastorally to the Erebus families. Well, late last year the government did finally agree, and now progress is steaming ahead. They don't think they'll have the memorial ready for November 2019, it'll bump into 2020, but Memorial's better than just hitting the 40th anniversary. So I wanted you just to know about that. Do have a look at the Erebus website, Erebus National Memorial, which we created. If you know of Erebus families, please ask them to register. And is there one more slide? There is. Right, talking about Dominies, uh, Rapides, this is my father's Dominey on the Shot Over River in Queenstown. I've just finished my latest aviation book about the history of De Havilland Rapides. These are the longest flown aircraft in New Zealand. They've been flying every year in New Zealand since 1934, right up to the present day, uh, without a fatality, was this particular incident. So my book is about the DH-89 type and about this particular accident in the Shot Over River, which was a very unusual accident. And in my book, I critique air accident investigation in New Zealand today and point out some of the many inadequacies. I'll be launching the book here at Classic Flyers on the, uh, the 21st of November. And thanks to Bruce's cooperation, we'll have Dominey ZKAKU front and centre because it's also 75 years that very month that ZKAKU uh, flew here in New Zealand. A remarkable record. So uh, you'll probably know about that through Des and others. I'm tagging on those little comments at the end. I didn't want to miss them. Uh, yeah, folks, I'm just wondering if we've got just a few minutes, whether there are any questions? I was just wondering where the memorial to Erebus would be like. It's going to be, that's a very good question. Yeah, nothing's been released, but there was only 10 passengers who came from the South Island. The majority of passengers and the crew came from Waikato in Auckland. I think it's likely, the families tell us, the Erebus families tell us they want a memorial that is elegant, accessible, and not in cemetery. So um, I'm assuming it's going to land somewhere in the Greater Auckland area. But we'll see what the government decide they're, they're funding it. Yes? Intrigued by uh, the introduction of um, Sunday air operations. Yes. Uh, a big event at the time, yes. by comparison to today's yes. shopping, so to speak. Was the non-event of airline travel on Sundays a religious thing, or was it simply commercial? Yeah, probably a little bit of both, although the pre-war airlines actually flew on Sundays, rather ironic. 
So there was a bit of a sort of glitch with the wartime and then starting off in the 40s. So, uh, you know, of course, it was economic to fly seven days a week. Uh, when they brought these aircraft out to New Zealand, what sort of route did they fly? Uh, well, you know, the, the British Airlines were sort of freighted out, um, oh, but the Boeings, of course, were flown, you know, across the Pacific, and uh, and then the Fokker friendships from Europe, so a long ferry flights. It was considered a bit of a perk, I think, if you're one of the crew, you've got to go to Amsterdam to pick up the Fokker friendship and bring back to New Zealand. So quite some stories and photographs in our NAC book about those long ferry flights. Yeah, um, actually, as far as the first Boeing 737 was concerned, it actually flew over um, Brisbane, to mark arriving in New Zealand over where Captain Cook. They tried 1968, yes. Mm -hmm. What sort of um, uh, cost of flying in those days, we, to, like per Yeah, per I, I can't sort of immediately what tell you, Wally, that sort of the, uh, the numbers, except, except to say that um, it was very expensive. Mm -hmm. It was not really until the 1970s it was more accessible to ordinary people. And that's reflected on the, in the traffic numbers. but. Before the war in the 40s and 50s, a lot of business people flew rather than ordinary travellers, unless they had you know, discretionary money. And uh, also that was reflected on the standard of dress. So you, you, know, you dressed up, jackets and tie and, and, and hat. You didn't fly with, with jambles and t-shirts. People do today. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, thank you folks, be very attentive, it's a solid, Message, but that's uh, NAC which we uh, honour and remember. Thanks, to you. Made a few notes, Richard. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Bay of Plenty branch, thank you for presenting, uh, presenting the annual Jean Batten lecture this evening. We're grateful for the time uh, and your effort that you took to share your knowledge and thoughts about the history of New Zealand National Airways Corporation. As a state monopoly, NAC fulfilled its purpose in providing air services that met the needs of the people. A um, couple of things that I, you jolted my memory in your address. Um, DORAC, I remembered what it stood for, Development of Reservations uh, and Communication. And also, I've got Chess Lake sitting, he didn't know that I was sitting right behind him, but um, I was one of the first on the scene when BWO went over the end of uh, the okay. runway at Wellington Airport. I didn't work for NAC at the time. <laughs> didn't put you on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a reason. I thought I wouldn't mind joining the airline. Um, Chess and I were actually members of the Lowell Bay Surf Club, right? Chess, I don't know if you were on the beach that day, but we had a six-man training, and we were standing on the beach when we heard this noise. We all looked towards the airport, and we saw BWO tail first, pointing towards us going down the runway. Um, Andy Baggett was the skipper, and Bob Maris was the first officer. Apparently, they got a downwind component right on touchdown, and it was a wet runway, yeah. and it just aquaplaned down. Andy tried to get it off the runway onto the grass, thinking that that may help, but it just sort of plopped over the end. By the time it had plopped over the end, six of us guys were over the wall at the beach into one of Paddy Perkinson's car, you know Paddy, and we shot round to the end of the runway, climbed over the uh, hurricane fence, and uh, we were in bare feet and uh, swim gear, and we actually beat the crash fire guys to the scene. <laughs> anyway, guiding air transport from a condition of post-war austerity to the relative luxury of jet age, NAC was always challenged to meet its mix mixture of social, political and commercial objectives. Your, your address was well researched, timed and informative. This subject is always of interest to me, being a 15-year employee of the airline. Uh, an organisation that I never left. It left me um, and the other dedicated members of the staff. Um, there was therefore much sentiment and uh, mixed emotion uh, with the merger with Air New Zealand uh, when it formally took effect. And the merging of the two airlines, um, it was NAC that got submerged. Mm -hmm. This question, however, was quickly lost by the travelling public. Um, interestingly, it's now 50 years 
and you pointed that out exactly since NAC introduced the Boeing 737 twin jet service into its timetable on scheduled routes. And um, I noticed that one of the sectors that they flew included Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin on a twin jet, something that you would probably be hard pressed to do today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like uh, uh, you to join me uh, and show your appreciation and thanking Richard uh, in the usual manner. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Alex, can you come forward and bring that little bag with you, do you mind? We'll get the charming air hostess to help draw the raffle. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> So the first prize is a um, serialised gift voucher from the Aviation Experience. This is a virtual reality combat flight simulation um, just down the road here. And um, that will be valid uh, indefinitely. And the number is 080. Ticket 80. Must have been one of the later ones to come in. Jim <laughs> Barron. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I, uh, I flew a F-18. I didn't say how well, but I tried it today. So <laughs> it's on, uh, it's on uh, uh, three, it's on all axis. Three axis, yeah. Okay, three second axis. one? Cool. Yes. Okay. The second is a gifted book. Five zero. There you go. There That for the branch Thanks, is a, um, something happening next week that uh, Peter Lane's uh, convening, which is the history of the Avenger 2505, which uh, some of us here have had a bit to do with. And uh, it will go back to Gisborne at some stage, and a uh, chap called the name of Clive Mead is going to talk about that history. Have well, they changed their name, have they? The name yes, it was in the, it's on the website today. I talked to Roger and he said, oh, oh yes, they're uh, finally getting around to it. So, and um, next month, the 5th of October, you've got me again, this time with uh, something dear to my heart, a tribute to Frank Whittle. And Frank Whittle is probably uh, the most dealt, dealt to uh, pioneer that you'd come across. And it's a great story. And further, the, uh, the, the museum here has got uh, four first generation jets, jet engines, on display. And none of them, none of them, uh, did Frank Whittle have any hand in. Uh, it's amazing. So uh, look forward to seeing whoever is uh, available. And lastly, um, uh, time for light supper. We have been casting around looking for the NAC biscuits <laughs> and we couldn't find any. Anyway, so we uh, got the Avgas Cafe to uh, dial up a set of uh, uh, batch of biscuits. Gary, could I ask you to grab those off the counter in the um, top uh, bar, please? So, uh, donations to help with expenses if you wish, and um, 
what we've also arranged with the museum is you're welcome to go and see the uh, NAC uh, display, the exhibits. Um, a good number of people, including Graham Lister and others, contribute uh, on going to those um, exhibits with uh, new pieces of memorabilia and so on. And uh, so it's um, like a lot of things that classic flies, it's a living museum and uh, it needs people to nurture those uh, exhibits and refine them, but it also needs uh, people like you and I to uh, support the museum. Yes, I'll open up the door through the armory so you can walk through them down, down the end of there and then down the stairs. Excellent, thanks Gary. And um, he didn't say so, but there is, uh, it was in the, uh, in the flyer, uh, some book sales that uh, Richard and Peter will convene uh, at the back of the room. So that's the end of the uh, 2018 uh, Gene Batten lecture and I uh, look forward to seeing you for the next one.